it's just me and you alone never lonely good morning Therese. thank you so much for sitting down and talking to me just about um all the advocacy you do around black food and black chefs i really appreciate you um being here i appreciate you having me i really like the idea of your blog and just some um, um encourage reading it and encourage the people are just generally more curious and interested in talking to and hearing from black creatives yeah i think it's definitely important i mean just searching through there's not that much content there's a few coverage right of oh look at these like black chefs but the in-depth things that you're doing especially like on your platform is i think we need more of that so before we start talking more about what you're doing currently let's get a little bit to the backstory right so I know sure. New Jersey is your hometown. So I'm actually now in Jersey myself. Um, so um, it's definitely its own entity there, um, being in Newark. And you now live in East Harlem. So both of these areas are, of course, historically communities of color. How have these places kind of shaped your own perspective regarding Blackness and Black food? It's a really interesting question. And I'm not sure that growing up in Newark, I really not sure that I re that made the connections really until I got much older and left um, and lived in places that maybe weren't as diverse and certainly not as rooted. Um, I grew up in Newark in a part of the city um, called the Weekway Section. It's a sort of, it's now considered historically black, but traditionally have been the sort of epicenter of white flight. Um, I mean, I grew up in a, a Baptist church that was at one point a synagogue and my grandparents came into Newark really sort of right around the, the riots in um, the late 60s, like that's sort of when every city was burning. Um, Newark was sort of one of those epicenter sort of hubs where, I mean, I don't know, neighborhood I grew up in, two blocks over um, was Amiri Baraka. And so you hear these stories of people like Gordon May Grosna and Toni Morris, all these people in community in New York, but you don't realize that they were also um, physically in community in, in cities like Newark. And so I don't know that I had. I think, I, I mean, I certainly remember this, this sort of feeling of being in this very Black place and being infused. I mean, I grew up on the street with like two city council people and this sort of sense of activism and activation, but I don't know that it really resonated until I, I left and got perspective. Um, years later, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm almost 40 and I've yeah, I been living in East Harlem for about 12 years and it's just a sense of the sense of insulation, um, if that makes sense, like this sort of cultural insulation um, that cities like Newark and cities like um, Harlem. Like the thing about it too, Harlem becomes this like Harlem is different than Manhattan. Harlem is this um, this sort of jewel box uptown it's above 96th Street. This sort of other entity, but it is. Um, highly protected, um, highly culturally protected. And that kind of, I don't know, that, that sort of feeling of your neighbors not just being um, like physical neighbors, but sort of cultural stakeholders, I think is something I'm really interested in. I think I make the, I see those correlations so much clearer from when I was growing up, I mean, I don't know. It's a really long way to answer to say that, yeah, both places sort of the, the, the my synapses are sort of realizing the connections much more um, keenly in moments like this, but certainly in my own work, like I'm realizing if I had maybe been more conscious of those um, the benefit, like sort of birthright of what I was growing up in, um, I think my path to this part of my work would have been maybe a little quicker. Um, even choice to go into food, right? Like, I mean, there's a woman named uh, Cleo Johns who was in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, was like one of the go-to caterers in the sort of tri-state area. She's like, you find these records of her at the times, it's like, you know, rated among the best and most sort of sought after caterers. She was this black woman from North Carolina who operated her business in Maplewood, New Jersey. Um, I wonder sometimes what 
my how my perspective would have changed about the possibilities of my own career if I had had even those an example of example like Miss Johns um, sort of draw from when I was going to culinary school and thinking about um, how and what I was seeing as possible or representative of of um, possibilities. But that example is right there in Newark. It's right there. It's right there in my backyard, and I didn't know better. I mean, I think, right, that's that's a problem is that there is so much of this history that's just not told, not recognized. So people think, wow, there's no one that's been doing it, right? This is new or I'm kind of breaking barriers, not knowing it was happening. So that's very clear. So then what caused you if you didn't have kind of these kind of role models to look up to, what made you go to culinary school in the first place? I mean, so Newark is a, you could go on and talk about Newark for, you know, for, for many reasons, but um, I grew up in the... I graduated high school in the late 90s and there was this sense of technology sort of emerging as, um, you know, the, the emerging industry that was going to be um, responsible for the workforce in the next decade, 20 years. I graduated in 99. So, um, you know, if you were the possibilities for um, urban youth during that era. Um, so this, so you, you hear a movement towards STEM in this moment, in this era, but back then it was really focused on um, this emerging technology we really didn't understand a lot about. And so I went to a high school in North that was, um, it was one of the few magnets back then. And it was just, uh, every summer I was at Rutgers doing like combinatorics programs. It just, I thought computer engineering was gonna be my path. It just was all set, right? But I also started to think about possibility in terms of career. And it was a sense of like, especially during my junior year, I was watching um, mentors in the, the sort of tech world who seemed perfectly happy with their jobs and seemed like they, but there was a sense of this is gonna be my life. I, I honestly thought I was gonna go to Rutgers. I was gonna you know, get multiple degrees in computer engineering. I'll probably stay in Newark and maybe you know, work for a company like Prudential, help and you know, just, I don't know, just the, the, there was just this, this really sort of clear cut sense of what was possible in the outlook long-term. I mean, to be able to see the possibilities for your career that far out and have it feel so settled, but also that what I didn't know, I don't know that I had a, a sense of passion for that path it just felt secure and like the, the the simplest and most sort of direct pathway to um not even getting out of north but just sort of a clear path to like upper mobility and that's all well and good but i think at, at 17 at 18 i really was also considering my friends who had other passions like i was there's a program called axo for through the naacp um it's a really great program and it's actually still around um but it's this it's this high school program that um really does attract students through the whole school year and axo afro afro academic cultural scientific technical olympics and so you have this cross-section of high school students who are wrapped up by professionals, mentors from all these different areas. And wherever your passion lies, you get to sort of follow your passion through this competition process the whole school year. And it was so dope. I mean, I, I, I was in this thing all four years of high school. It is just, it's one of the best programs. It's one of the things that people dismiss about the NAACP. It's one of their like signature programs. And it all of that to say, I was in this program and thinking, and again, like the, the sort of seeing your pathway so clear so that with these other tech um sort of technology science driven students but i was also in community with um friends and students who went to arts a good friend of mine tashon sorry is like one of the most lauded um jazz musicians of our generation um he was we were contemporaries, right? Like we were in the same we were in competitions together. So you be in these environments where you were watching people who were really passionate about the thing they wanted to do. And I don't know that I had that same level of passion for tech and sort of engineering. I could do it. I saw um, that I could be good at it. And, but I don't know that I was that passionate. I'm watching, you know, my friend Tashawn really just give his whole self over to this thing. And I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't relate on that level. 
But I did love cooking. And I think that was also um, sort of subconsciously um, consuming early food media. So, you know, PBS and uh, Food Network um, to see people like Tanya Holland and Cheryl Smith on Food Network in the early days when it was, you know, this was not reality television. This was, you know, the first real sort of sprinkles of like modern cooking in the in the sort of cable television world and so again like this was none of this was intellectualized back then but i certainly saw and thought about i really do love cooking could this be a possibility but nobody i knew um in my like my family or my world had any reference point for what that meant and, or that it was a viable career choice so my mother did what, I mean, mothers, I grew up with a single mother. She, I mean, I got early admission to Rutgers. That was, we were set. And so she said, if you're going to give away this very clear cut opportunity, I need you to be clear about what that's going to look like. You want this other thing, what is it going to look like? Um, so she, she, to her credit, I mean, we went on all of the, like, um, college tours and went to Johnson Wales and CIA and all the schools at the time that were or <laughs> viable at that time. There were a couple. I would think that we, I mean, the French Colonel was kind of around, but um, there, were, there weren't a lot of options and there certainly weren't options that gave you actual degrees. Again, my mother was, you're going to give up a career path that has a degree that's transferable versus a certificate from somebody's school. I don't know. Um, so I chose Johnson Wells, but it was really such, it was really a quick kind of thing. It was really over that summer before my senior year, and it was could this be a is this a real career? Not really understanding the landscape at all. And when we found Johnson Wells, and I realized that like I could not just get a coding degree, but also get a business degree and kind of be prepared to still have a backup, but to still sort of be introduced and prepared for this thing that felt artistic, but also felt out of my wheelhouse at that point, um, became like an easy, easy transition. Wow. Well, I commend you for being young and being like, okay, what really drives me and choosing it then, right? Because a lot of people end up finding their like years later, ch changing it. So the strength that you have there to be like, what is really, do I feel connected to is definitely amazing. Um, and so you went to culinary school, of course, and then you graduate. And so what was it like having gone from, okay, I love the idea of cooking. I'm going to switch this up and go um, to culinary school. And now I'm a cook. Like I'm a trained culinary cook. Like, and now I'm out in the world. Was it different for you? Did you ever think, man, should I have chose something more stable? Or did you feel, no, this is in fact a clear cut career path that I didn't know could be this stable? Well, the, the thing about culinary school, I think, is, and it's the, it's the thing that I wish people were considering more when they're making a choice to come to this industry, is really that this, the tool of culinary school is really only as valuable as, as how you apply it, right? Like, the value of culinary school, to my, in my opinion, is that you get a concentrated amount of time to really focus on craft. There are lots of people who go out into the industry and work for the same amount of time, like the same, you know, culinary degree. Mine was four years, but they're two-year programs. They're 18 month programs all around the country where you can go and focus for the 18 months or whatever. That's saying it's something there. Are some people in our industry who think that spending the same 18 months working, if you're able to get into a good kitchen, working and getting practical knowledge during the same 18 months is just as valuable. I'm not sure I agree. I will say um, that I, God works in mar miraculous ways because um, at the time Johnson Wells was in Providence, Rhode Island. And I did a year there and it was so sort of that traditional college experience, but it was certainly eye-opening and God gave me a really good co-sign that I was doing the right work, that I was prepared and I was doing well and all that kind of thing. But I had gone um, to Atlanta uh, for my like internship year, the old internship section of your training, and circumstances kind of con like sort of coalesced and ended up transferring campuses to Charleston, South Carolina. And it was, Charleston was never even on my radar. I mean, I was, I'm a North, I'm, I grew up in North New Jersey. I'm not going to South Carolina. Like, you know, I'm going to stay as close to home. That sort of sense of like knowing the New England <clears throat> landscape and just, that was, that's why I chose it. But transferring to Charleston, was, it changed my life. Um, the chefs I was training with, 
the restaurants I was working in, the cultural environment of Charleston, um, all define a lot of what I saw as maybe not possibility in terms of my long-term career, but certainly um, seeing the tangible stability of black and brown people as working chefs, right? Like if I had stayed in, in Providence, if I had worked other places, I maybe would not have seen as many black and brown people um, working professional chefs. And also will say that as a sort of, you get to a place you're training, especially in a four-year program where um, your focus really changes, right? Like you think about the back way, this is again, I'm aging myself, but way, way back then, Johnson was had this thing called a, um, a passport. It was this big blue binder you would get your freshman year. And it was this real sort of like, this is this idea like dream building, but you really do you sort of leaf through this thing. And it says like, what is the, the abstract thing you think you want to do? Like you have no experience, but you're thinking about long-term. What's the ultimate, like longest term goal you think you want to do with your life, career, et cetera. And you leave through it, say, I want to be the executive chef of a four-star resort in the Caribbean. Like, it's really that specific. And you leave through it, and it will give you this rubric for how, how prepared you are to do that thing. And so certainly through your degree, you'll sort of check off a lot of those things, right? You'll learn the account, all those things. You'll learn skills, but they're also longer-term um, goals that sort of you'll pick up as you go through your career and so it's a thing that you'll kind of keep with you through your career and kind of check and see like check in with yourself about how prepared you are to do that thing I started to, I mean I don't know just through training watching different areas of the industry sort of what you're seeing restaurants up close seeing hotels all those so all those places where you know your degree will be applicable um I, I, always, I was always very clear and very sort of, I saw the landscape, I saw what the numbers look like, I understood like what my personal passion and skill sets sort of applied to, and I always wanted to be a caterer. Um, at the time, it was not the sexiest possibility, it was not the, it was not what most of my peers were training to do, um, there wasn't a lot of support um, in terms of how to long-term do that thing because everybody wanted to be Sean Brock at the time. Everybody wanted to be, you know what I mean? There was a sense of like the fine dining and restaurant was really the only valuable place to be um, a quote unquote chef. And I was able to reject that, um, reject that really early and not feel um, maybe marginalized by it. But the powerful thing for me was that in, because it was no, um, there was no example of it that I could find in the school. I had to start looking outside of it. And it was one of those things where all of a sudden I'm like, hmm, black people disproportionately overrepresented in this segment of our industry. Um, the math makes just more sense um, in terms of the business model. Um, it just felt more like personally fulfilling the pathways to ownership and sort of um, it just it just all made sense for me. So when I left school, I was because I had an eye towards this particular segment of our industry early on. Every choice I was making about internships, about who I was looking to as mentors, where I was looking for like like first jobs, even um, were all the choices were super simple for me. So I left. I mean, I left school with a job. Like I had gone to a career fair my senior year and got a job before spring break of my senior year and was sort of off and running right away. Well, I think that this is again an example of you kind of choosing against this path that's laid out for you, right? So again, you went from deciding computer engineering, this is a long-term thing, it's what people are pushing you towards. My passion's not there, I'm gonna do something different. And then again, right, the whole fine dining, not, uh, the whole fine dining thing, you were like, again, this is not really where my passion lies, I'm gonna go against the grain. So it seems like continuously you've done that, right? Going against the grain with your career. And so once you had kind of graduated, going into your first job, how did you end up um, ending up in the recipe consultant um, lane? What was that development from wanting to be a caterer to then, okay, I'm going to actually be developing recipes for others? So I will say that like, I think that my, my interest was 
definitely not in the restaurant segment, but I definitely loved and had an eye towards fine dining, right? This sort of, because I, I also realized that like the, the best training school for caterers, in my opinion, is hotels. Um, hotel catering is, I mean, foundationally, I don't care if you're a fine dining restaurant, if you live in Madison Park or you are sort of a soul food restaurant, the, the, the traditional, the sort of, sort of classical frameworks we all do our work from really kind of were born out of hotels, right? Like, you know, Escoffier um, is sort of, the Scafe and the Ritz Hotel is where all of this, all of our traditions kind of come from. That aside, um, I mean, I was, I took my first job. I was working in Atlanta right after college. I moved back to New York and was working for seasons. Um, I mean, in, in, in hotels, I worked in the restaurants within those, those, those um, operations. Um, my last job working for someone else was um, with Joe Robichon, the Latelier. Um, so last year or so, my time there was really spent um, soaking up all of the all the tools I would need um, to apply to my own business. But I was also in my mid twenties and had no real real reference points for how to really run a business on my own, what any of that would look like. I just had the tools to sort of gave me my own taste level and I felt like I had enough training um, to sort of start. But I had met through my mom a, a trio of women who were self-publishing their first book and a cookbook. And it was this, it was, I'm, I don't know how old you are, but the, the like late 2000s was this really, really even the mid, I thought like the early to mid 2000s. So I, I, made, I moved back to New York in like 2005. It was, um, Food Network was sort of evolving at this point. Um, a lot of publications, a lot of organizations, um, folks were sort of figuring out all of a sudden, like miraculously, that um, Black women were this market that no one was paying attention to, no one was sort of marketing to, listening to, that Black women were becoming this demographic that was highly educated, had, you know, Career oriented, had disposable income, were in terms of if this moment has taught us nothing else, Black women in this demographic are some of the most um, that we able to move culture. And so there was a time where a lot of brands were spending money to sort of think about market to our, this demographic. And so these three women were writing this cookbook called The Get Em Girls Guide to the Power of Cuisine. And it was this book sort of about essentially in the midst of a sex in the city moment, why would why is it cute to not know how to cook? Why is it if you if you if we're thinking about the ways in which we engage our lives, um, shouldn't we not use should we not use all the tools at our disposal to make our lives beautiful, make our lives what we want them to be? And how can you be a black woman born out of a tradition that is so rooted in care and of in rich coin traditions and just you can't have a black grandmother and not know how to cook and that's not cute so essentially how do we teach our generation how to cook um and they again they were self-publishing it because they weren't asking for permission um but they also had none of them had any real reference point for the culinary industry they were all they had all worked in different areas one was in the entertainment one was in like she was an event planner, and another girl was working like corporate in like fire Pfizer, like a so none they just were they were the demographic they were talking to, but they were sort of trying to get women to think about cooking. So I kind of came in as a sort of recipe consultant because it was this amazing idea, but let's actually teach them how to cook. Um and it was interesting because I was just starting with four seasons and just back in New York and just sort of feeling like, huh, I'm back kind of home and defining what this next thing, next part of my life is gonna be like, but this is sort of a good, it felt like um, I met them at the right time to, and they were slightly older than me. So it was like this sense of being, like it felt like having sisters, having like older sisters to sort of help me to sort of grow up. 
and grow up empowered to do the thing I thought I wanted to do and make mistakes and learn as I was, as we were all growing. And we self-published it. It was beautiful. It was a time, it was back in the days when like the sister to sister um, expo would happen, like out the Javis Center and just all of these, there was all these, these spaces for black women to sort of be in community um, in really interesting ways. And their brand was perfectly placed um, at that moment. And so the, again, self published the book. So we would start doing all these events to sort of help promote it. Because again, you don't have a big publisher to sort of um, have marketing PR. So we started doing all of these like pop-up kind of things before the pop-up was a pop-up. It was a real construct. Um, yeah. So, but they, but because we would do all these events, um, I would cater them, right? Because we come, you know, I'm the Kone, so the, the yeah, I'm the P, you, you all want to, you know, you have a cookbook, but you don't, don't actually cook and you, or you can't translate it to like a professional context. So, you know, we would do things like Macy's Culinary Council back in the day and all these kinds of events. And I would provide the culinary sort of component. And it was interesting to sort of watch that moment evolve to me. Just, uh, it was just, they were in really interesting. In they were excited, it was like five years ahead of their time. Um, but I really got, I mean, all I have to say, um, they ended up, uh, Simon Schuster kind of got a hole. I got to like sort of, sort of found them and realized, oh, true. The point of, it, like all these lessons that I'm realizing that I didn't even, I wasn't, I was absorbing, but I didn't really appreciate back then. But like this idea around book publishing, right? Like they did all the legwork, like they, branded themselves, did all the marketing PR, had a market that they could easily translate or easily explain. Um, we had a following, right? And so Simon Schuster bought and optioned a second book. And so I was able to, I came into the first project um, on the tail end of it, just sort of, y'all had these recipes, had these ideas, I just kind of helped you help them. Um, sort of polish them. But then the second book, I was really able to sort of contribute recipes and do all the recipes, I mean, all the food styling. And it's sort of, it's not, the recipe consultant is not, uh, it's not a part of a business that is um, super expansive. It's really sort of project-based and like sort of derivatives of friends of friends or um, in its original sort of framework, it was because I was helping to build this company. Um, it's just a skill that it sort of developed by necessity. And it was so, this is, that's, that's, that was a sign of my, my 20s. It was sort of being in a community with typically women, but being in a community with older folks who were either in need of some, some skills that I had, but also had all this wisdom and, and gave me room to um, find myself and to sort of define myself and support me sort of growing into what I wanted to be or seeing the possible. See, it's showing me how to, to sort of get the tools I would need to do the thing I wanted to do. Well, I think honestly, that sounds like an amazing experience. So like you said, having got your training, that groundwork in those hotel kitchens and then see a way that you could connect with, right? Mentors who looked like you, who were advancing the culture for you at such a young age, right? A lot of people are not fortunate enough to be immersed kind of in that um, black, trend setting black culture at that time. So that's definitely an exciting thing that they were doing. Um, but it's also funny when you mentioned that they were doing all this legwork, right? They got their branding up and then the big publishers, of course, took notice and were like, wait a minute, this is something that actually does have value, right? This has those things. And I feel like even today, right? What, 15 years later, it's still a thing where we're kind of doing that legwork first and then the mainstream was like, hold on a minute, let's tap in here, not knowing what was already there, right? So. Yeah. And obviously that's what you hear all, that's, that's the craziest thing, I, like, especially in the food world, is I'm, it's, it translates to every part of our culture, but the the overnight success or the come from, the came from nowhere story is so dismissive. It's like, so you just, you completely disregard all the legwork and all of the tears and all of the sacrifices that these brands make to come to get to the marketplace only to be sort of dismisses this sort of this benefactor comes and like makes you fly I'm like mm, I don't know about that 
Yes, no, I think like you're right, but just kind of like showing, right, that this is this is hard work that's that's happening and like for yourself, right, behind the scenes. So now, of course, you have your platform, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. But once you left that company after having worked with them, you kind of went out on your own and was really building and seeing what stuck, right, before you figured yeah. it out. So what was that for you? Why didn't you go back to kind of that comfort of those hotel kitchens and, and what you knew? What made you decide to strike out on your own? for me it was it was mainly that i had learned the language of, of being self-employed like i had i had learned the, or sort of gotten accustomed to try my own course i think that there's something really interesting about or particular about um your correlation to earn to earning money in our industry i think there's such a the lack of humanity sometimes that exists in the way we do this work is so striking to me and i think covid has that's the main lesson covid has taught me um so a lot of times when you are working for other people in this industry um there are goals and expectations whether they be financial or um eth ethical sort of frameworks that these uh, operations are running or oh, sort of exist in it that disregard um the humanity of the bodies the lives that make those mechanisms work um we talk a lot about value defined dining space a lot right like they are Mashama bailey is a perfect example um her new book is out now and it is a masterpiece but in it she is mm, profoundly transparent about a lot that no one ever talks about in this industry. Um, to start from a place of humanity is not a typical MO in this work. And the sacrifices that you have to make as an operator to be able to do what Mashama and Jano have done is atypical. And I found myself at a place um, I mean, it's, it's, a round, it's a roundabout sort of answer, but in 2008, I mean, the, the economy downturn dramatically for everybody, right? Like, you know, our country was essentially in financial crisis. We were, you know, optimistic about the Obama administration, but the economy was unsure. And I had just left uh, Four Seasons at that point. I, I thought this was, you know, we about to, we had done, um, Russell Simmons used to do the Hip Hop Summit every year. That, that year we had been in Atlanta doing all the green rooms and it was the most amazing experience. And I was like, I'm having to decide between my full-time job that I love, that like is the thing I've trained for is, you know, sort of, I was watching, um, an organization like Four Seasons is like the kind of organization if you stay with and sort of keep constant with, you will advance regardless of um, any glass ceilings, right? Like there's there were possibilities there, but there were possibilities that were always beholden to someone else's, like uh, this organization's um, sort of goals. And I was watching my three friends offer me an opportunity to sort of find myself and so I, had, I was making these compromises on time right like you are in this industry doing this work in, with these inhumane hours but you give yourself over to it 100 percent. and i don't have the ability to split my loyalties in that way and so it was the exact i mean i remember that summer coming back and giving notice gave like three months notice chain person who replaced me leave then the economy downturns and I'm like, oh, and feel, I felt so crushed. It was like the first like legitimate grown up choice I made that felt like a step out. And like, it felt like some sort of sign that like I had made some crazy mistake. But what came after it was the sort of seeds to my current work. Like in, in that moment, like the clarity that I had, that I wouldn't have had if I was safe and secure. Um, birth this next era of my work but perfect i mean for a lot the, this crime project is one thing but professionally or sort of come from a colony point of view i just couldn't see where i was gonna fit in now i mean i had spent so many years um trying my own course how was i gonna go back to having someone else to find what i cooked and how i related to um 
to customers and it just didn't make sense to me. So it was always a no brainer to sort of professionally um, figure out um, a way to, to do business. And I ended up mainly focusing on private chef work. Um, a lot of clients that we had been working with um, under the Get Em Girl umbrella, we were, you know, we're industry folks, um, like entertainment industry folks or um, sort of brands that we had just been in community with. And when we closed the business, it was like, hey, you guys, wait, you guys know, we don't have your jerk chicken. Oh no, we don't have, what happened? Um, and so I was able to sort of use um, a lot of those relationships and sort of to build a very tiny um, a group of clients. And that's, I mean, that's, it's been they've been sustaining me many many years and but it's a super small business and it doesn't really have a lot of long you know, sort of broad bold long term goals to sort of allow me to have this Kone space this Kone respite that is allows me to earn money and then I can invest that into the scholarship side of my life that allows me to be a student right like the the joy of the last 12 years has been the time to slowly learn and be prepared to do this next era of my work let's talk about that I mean like you said I think you have a good dynamic going where you're able to like you said do something you've trained for still with what context you feel comfortable with cooking the food that you love but also being able to go through this next stage so can you talk some about when did you really start diving deep into the history of the food you were making, of the Black people, of course, who have been making this food for so long? And how did that cause you to ultimately launch, of course, BlackCulinaryHistory.com? Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, that economic downturn, I think, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about doing like a oral history project to folks who went through the OA downturn because it, it really does become this really interesting starting point for a lot of folks. Um, it was clarifying for a lot of people. Um, and for me, certainly, it was this moment where I had to really decide why I was in this industry. It was, we were, we were our industry was sort of, I won't say that it was in crisis or the crisis was not um, fully comparable to this moment, but it was certainly a moment where um, we were having to recalibrate how we did business and what we thought the industry was going to be like. It was just, it was, it was a particular moment. And I remember really clearly the Christmas that year, um, sort of sitting down in my grandparents' house with my mom, sort of figuring out what the next thing was going to look like. A lot of our corporate clients who had committed to first and second quarter events were like, hey girl, huh? we're going to have to put a pause on all that. So sort of that like Christmas respite of like, that sort of recentering a lot of people do around Christmas. Um, for me, it was really sort of a soul searching moment of what, what, why was I doing this work? What were the real motivations for what I saw as the next era of my, my, my work? Um, and also, I think I was, I think maybe it was infused by the, the sort of looming or the sort of um, immediacy of an Obama presidency, but I really was thinking a lot about um, identity. And there were, I mean, I don't know, just uh, there were a lot of conversations that were happening at the moment. And I think, again, like I wish I was back then I had been more, more circumspect because I think I would have kind of, I wish I was journaling or something back then to sort of, um, sort of really capture the, the, the frame my I would the the frame of mind I was in but I really I because well or at least what was happening in the zeitgeist that really kind of were the connective points but I don't know that I was um it all was super organic at the time it was just the questions I was asking myself about why I didn't know more chefs more black chefs I mean I certainly had mentors like I said certainly have people that I was talking to in community with who were my sort of nucleus um in that way but on a real sort of macro level, I didn't, they, that was, that was the era where we didn't have, Tanya Holland wasn't on TV anymore. We, we didn't have a lot of, as this, this sort of visible media mechanism was evolving or sort of erupting, um, we didn't have a lot of representation. So why didn't I know more Black chefs? Why was that, why was not a community with more Black chefs? Why didn't I know just more of the landscape? Um, and that felt like a personal, for like a personal defect, but it also felt like a sort of personal problem that I could very easily start to address personally, like individually. 
But I also realized that, like, as I was doing this individual work, that it may resonate with someone else, right? It may be valuable to someone else. So what would it be? And it's also the moment when social media is becoming really the, it's starting to become the juggernaut that it is now, right? Like, the 2008 Facebook was really just becoming um, viable in a sort of mainstream way. It had been underground, right? It had been around for a while, but I don't know that it had been part of our everyday lives. People were just joining up, just sort of figuring out that it was use, it could be useful. Um, and I, I remember seeing my mother with this like spiral bound notebook, thinking about what was next. And I remember thinking about a digital archive. I remember thinking about um, if I was having this problem and I was conscious of it and was a lot farther along in my career, what must that be like for you know, an 18 year old? What, 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 what is, was it like for me when I was um, coming to this industry not really um, having any context or reference point for it? And so I, I remember writing this very earnest, but I don't, misguided is an unfair word, but it's certainly um, overly earnest letter, um, like email, and ask my mom or anybody, most people I know, I said, who do you know Black and Food? Like, who do, like, just give me a list of names, give me email addresses, and I remember sending this thing out to about 40 people, um, and it was basically, hey, um, my, I'm young, I don't know a lot, I'm, you know, sort of at this sort of first wave of my career. I'm asking myself a lot of serious questions about why we do this work. It feels like a gift to be able, I still have it up on my website because it's so, it's a good reminder of um, where this project started, but it was just, it's, I remember saying something like, you know, we gifted, it's, it was so, it's, it's a little cringy vulnerable. now, but. It sounds vulnerable but it was, to people you want to be in community with, right? It was like it was. I, was, I said something like, "We are like we are blessed to be able to like do this creative thing that we you know that we are blessed to do work that we find creative and valuable to us." But shouldn't it mean more than just the personal like satisfaction validation? It has me more to one another. And it has me more um, to legacy. What does that mean? Like, is this does this sound crazy? What is like what should I be doing personally to be more connected to that idea? But also I'm going to share with y'all what I find. And it was like, it was as simple as that. And so started the website. It was on a site. It, I used to host it on a platform called Name. Um, I know, again, like, I don't know if people consuming this, this interview um, remember Michael Bay's name. He had a, like a radio network at the time. And it was, he was one of the few people who um, was, uh, who understood the power and the value of these new emerging networks, but he hosted on this Ning platform. And Ning is actually still around. It's like, so it was sort of an alternative to us. I think at the time it was probably fancying itself an alternative to Facebook um, because a lot of people hadn't discovered Facebook yet, right? People would join it, but they weren't really, you didn't know, know how to apply it. So the platform replicated Facebook in a lot of ways. People could join and create their profile and interact. And it was great. I mean, I also started the Facebook group at the same time, and people were co essentially consuming what we were doing on Facebook more than Ning. So I stopped paying for this platform and used uh, Facebook. Um, but also the website it grew, right? I, it went from, you know, just a landing page to us interacting and engaging on Facebook to the site being, I mean, the site is actually very simple. We actually relaunched it in a couple of weeks, but, um, you know, right now it's like, here, to, here are hundreds of hours of video from people, institutions, voices you should care about. Instead of watching cat videos or watching trap videos or whatever, watch Jessica Harris talk for an hour about, you know, contending with the African diaspora. Watch Verna Mae Grosner give us the framework for calling anthropology just all kinds of things, right? So I figured that's one thing I could do. I could, could scour the internet, find these videos I think is very valuable. Here are the books I'm reading. Here's what I've consumed. Here's how I've learned the truth. Here are the books that benefit um, deep understanding around these food ways. Maybe you want to read them too, so here's a list. Um, and again, this is all as like a side project, right? Like this is all, this is all, I'm, 
I'm still working as a full time professional chef um, and doing this in like the you know three o'clock hour, three a.m. hour after shit after work. And so I don't know. I think early on it was su- a super simple um, organic project, but it was really born out of my own need for catharsis and my own need for um, trying to know more and be more prepared to be effective and whatever. Um, it was going to be, and I feel like it's also, I mean, again, we turned 12 this month, yeah. and it was like, it's kind of been in, in, in eras, right? Like, first two or three years, I mean, there was a woman, this, there is a woman, um, Erica Davis, Erica, um, Erica Dupree Klein now, um, she's a pastry chef um, based in Jacksonville, Florida. She's have an organization called Colony Wonders USA. I mean, Erica Davis is someone who you think about the chefs of the 90s who were kind of generationally a half step behind like a Patrick Clark or um, some of these other chefs, like they were the black chefs who I, who were visible to me. Like when I met her in 2008, when I was starting this work, she was started in Kone Wonders because she was, like, she was half a generation ahead of me, half a step ahead of me um, generationally. But she was the, she was, her generation was the chefs who definitely didn't have any visibility. I was a baby chef, but she was somebody who was running resorts, like running the patient programs at like golf resorts. And she was in community with the few black voices, the few black chefs in positions of power in our industry were all kind of conversion in her organization. And so when I say mentorship and folks who were who I was in community with, who was sort of showing me what was possible. That's what I'm talking about. But she was sort of, there are errors in my work, right? So like uh, the early era was sort of coming behind them and sort of listening um, to what they would tell me about how they came up. Because there were certain, there's certain, you, know, you made this point earlier, but like there's nothing really new under the sun. As much as we think that the, an era or a moment is, um, different than is it's actually not and so we are because we have such short historical memories um we miss the lessons that were left behind and so the first couple of years of this work was really just me listening um you know finding the best smartest um elders and listening i mean joe randall telling me years ago that I was going to have to go back to school. Like y'all are going, he said, you, you all are going to have to get more degrees. Y'all are going to be prepared to teach this. How are you going to, how are we going to um, condemn young people for not knowing if you all don't teach them? So you, you're going to have to get degrees. You're going to have to figure it out. Um, you know, before she passed, like Leah Chase telling me that catering was valuable like that that I had I had already been doing this work for a decade but to hear her say the words that like to understand this business or to sort of see yourself and carve your niche and not be beholden to what anybody else thinks affirmed me at 30 something like that but that yeah so this the second I think the second era you know like 2012 2014 that that era was really sort of what does this look like? I think I know something now. Not quite sure yet what what this all got us out to, but I think I know some things. Um, what does that look like? And so started trying to become a better writer. Um, research got a little bit more intensive, and again, research in the, in the food world is tricky. I, I have just sort of stepped into the um, the framework of um, people call want to use the, the terminology around colon, being a culinary historian. I think I was resistant to like sort of stepping into that framework because um, it usually has a very academic connotation. I think about people like Jessica Harris, I think about people like Tony Tinton Martin who have a lot of work product, have a lot of receipts for what qualifies them to do that work. But at the core of it, um, the work of a historian is really about being a student of history and making connections about how valuable and how contextual those lessons are. Um, and so, I don't know, just sort of four or five years ago, I started writing more. Um, I started applying, I mean, one of the, the tricky things about research in the, the food world is that um, as it relates to Black history, 
there are very few actual records. Um, a lot of it is trying to find records of sort of evidences in other places where food references may have been made and sort of doing this interesting detective work. But it's, I mean, so some of the stories that you find help you to, to make the case for, I think that there, there are things I know intellectually to be true that I'm constantly in search of receipts for because I don't want, like, like Michael Twitty, I don't want anybody to be able to check me. Um, <laughs> but I also want to be able to um, not conflate history in a way that, that disempowers the real agency of some of these stories, right? Like you tell a story about someone like A. North, we know Solomon's story, right? Like we know um, 12 years a slave and that he was found and all this, but we don't think about how he was found. Well, because Andy was an amazing pastry chef and she was out in the streets actually earning money and had cachet and had social capital um, and had a lot more mobility than black women of her era would have had. So she doesn't have the resources, Solomon doesn't get found. Like, so I just did something about reframing stories through a lens that moves center certainly into empowering Black agency, but then also telling the truth about those stories in a way that maybe it's not as romantic, but it's certainly more valuable because it's truthful. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I, maybe uh, it was like two years ago, I got a book agent because it was becoming clear um, that there was a book that needed to be written and it was sort of I think I was still in search of something clicking into place to feel prepared to really write intentionally and it's it's been so interesting to watch the universe kind of watch God work because there's so much about the book I proposed two years ago that I was wildly unprepared to write but it took the zeitgeist shifting it took um the framework of what we found valuable in this industry to shift um and also uh, just research wise there's some some points that like i've uncovered in the last two years that if i had not had um access to I did points to parts of this book that would never, would never have been valuable if I hadn't found this, these pieces to the puzzle. So I like to say that um, this is forever work for me. Um, I'm actually finding, um, as I'm turning 40, like I'm actually less interested in my hardcore culinary life and much more beholden to being effective and being more um, sort of beholden to this sort of scholarship around our food ways full time. So the universe is like opening up in ways that is allowing me to do it more full time, but it's sort of, it's because it's by necessity, right? Like we, these are, these are such urgent times. Like, I don't know, I've been rereading Vertimate Girls a lot recently and like people reference Vibration Cooking a lot. That book is beautiful, right? Like it's, it's sort of her opus to Black agency in in the culinary world. She's telling her truth about who she was and why the little country was amazing and why you should just defer to her, to to her black voice. But two or three years later, she wrote this book called Thursdays and Every Other Sunday Off. I mean, people again like vibration is fly, right? Like it's you know it's right up there. People reference that and like taste of country cooking constantly. Like those are like the two and like they the Malcolm and the 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 Martin of, of black culinary history, right? But Thursdays and every other Sunday off is her telling us in 1972 that we place far we basically need to think about our priorities. She made she calls it a domestic rap. It's this book about the honor and the sort of inherent beauty and the the generational heirloom that domestic work lives in, not as this sort of deferential, well, because we did it for generations, we should just, but just that there is tradition, there is expertise that lies in this work and that we prioritize these wildly flimsy areas of um, culture and sort of disregard um, the heirloom of Black culture. 
and she said in 72 she this predates the 77 shift of our industry into from a domestic sort of trade into a culinary profession she saw the writing on the wall she understood that we should be thinking about priorities before the zeitgeist really shifted and 50 years later i'm not sure that we really listened to what she had to say but that book feels profoundly timely in this moment it feels like precisely the message we should be listening to and thinking about as we sort of come out of this moment um as our industry is sort of coming out of this moment and having to ask some hard hard for lessons or hard for questions about who and what we are and who and what we prioritize mm, i like that though how you're right you're referencing back to that history of what was said um by someone like edna lewis right these kind of culinary giants i have a something that also came to mind right now when you talked about this shift right between it being a sense of domestic work, right? And then kind of being now we have, of course, the celebrity chefs and this whole culture around it. But when you look at who's mostly those, um, those big wigs, again, it shifted specifically more to white people, particularly white men, right? So you have this thing where this heritage that was built by mostly black women that was used to feed their families, et cetera, now being this complete almost golden key to fame and fortune. Um, and so it's interesting how when it shifts to something that's valued again, a, there's a different face on the industry. And now we have black chefs wanting recognition and wanting to be able to get that, you know, value that others are getting. So again, I think that the work that you're doing has so much benefit, not only in knowing, right, the history that's there, but also understanding what kind of is owed to culinary figures like you, like your contemporaries, like other ones that was already put in place by the ancestors. So I think that is very valuable. Um, can you talk a little bit about the premise of your book? Um, and if, if that's kind of where it leads to, because if so, I'm getting excited. <laughs> yeah, I think, so I sort of, I signed the agent by basically saying like, this is essentially like a people's history of black food history. Like it's sort of, it's the book I wish I would have had when I was coming to this industry is the sort of level set, right? If you read a book like um, Jess Caris's How on the Hog, it's the closest example of what I can think of as, as a perfect book. Like it, it is, in that book she, again, like Jess Caris is iconic, right? Her books, one of her best, people talk a lot about like Welcome Table, a lot of her books are all her books are wonderful, but she wrote this book in seventy in, in eighty six called High Stuff. It's her first cookbook, and it is her like. It's about she she calls it um, celebration of pecan. Or so I forget the tagline is, but it's basically like this sort of book that theory, that if you looked at on the surface, is a, sort of this book about chilies or sort of spice around the world, like high stuff, right? But in this introduction and the way she frames the book she basically says the words in 86 that the world was going to have to contend with the african diaspora that america the american dining was shifting and changing really rapidly that our priorities or where we what we were holding as central to valuable in the food world was wildly european and French focus, and that's all well and good, but our palace was shifting really rapidly and that you were gonna have to contend with these cultures that have far longer legacies, and, and far longer food traditions, far longer food legacies, and that spices, these sort of inherently delicious um, traditions are gonna become part of our palates, so get ready, right? Cut to, today i mean it feels prophetic right like the the, the taste of india the taste of the, the african continent <coughs> excuse me the taste of the caribbean she was telling us back then that we were going to be the, the 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 not just the sort of americanized asian cultures but like actual deference to these cultures and the the, the chefs and practitioners of them were going to become part of the zeitgeist but a book like that is her is one of her cookbooks that she wrote a book in 2011 called I'm High, called, um, High on the Hog. And it was a departure because it was not a cookbook for her. Like people had known her since 86 as a cookbook author. Um, she had done like a beauty book or something in between that. And she also was just known as this culinary historian, but she hadn't had a book that was very, it was full on nonfiction prose, not single subject, not a cookbook. It was hardcore scholarship. And it lays out this, to my mind, perfect foundation 
it's a cement foundation to the house we built colony, like that colony history on. She starts from the birth of the nation to the modern moment and talks about what makes that up? What are stories that she essentially does with and what, what Jessica Harris does? She tells stories and she, you know, offers us these sort of almost biblical stories um, in her voice that tell us in a linear way how we should be thinking about and contextualizing the contribution of Black lives to American gastronomy, right? Since 2011, again, we are. Why are we, we have Freddie Mac Rosner's Vibration Cooking and Thursdays, we got Edna Lewis's um, Taste of Country Cooking, In Pursuit of Flavor, the Edna Lewis Cookbook. The plotted points are relatively, there's some along the way as well, but 2011, to my mind, that's a bookend, right? This is, this is the bulk of the like two hands of scholarship that we have that tells us this true. Since then, right, like that book, I think, allowed publishers to be way braver, way more um, interested in thinking about um, paying deference to the possibility that we aren't telling the whole story around American food ways. And so then you gift it with something like um, Michael's The Cooking Gene, right? That's his very personal story. It does the same work. Um, of How on the Hog in terms of telling a linear story so that you can't check my scholarship, but it does it through the, his personal lens. That's a departure, right? Who, the, the, some of that work is having the expert, the sort of having, like, allowing deference to the writer to be the expert, a subject expert, right? Then Tony to Martin gives us the Jemima Code, right? That's a whole story about how it comes along, but she gives us the the literary receipts. She's through her own personal collection, through her own scholarship, is giving us another linear 200 years of history. That, so we got Jessica telling us the stories we need to know. We got Michael telling us what your personal identity means to this narrative. We got, you know, the, the book receipts. And then we even get um, Swinta de Martin's cookbook that is the translation of those heritage books, those that, that linear history, those literary receipts in a cookbook form. But I was always concerned, um, or not, concern is an unfair word too, but I was considering that as much as I've consumed all of their books and they've all informed how I do my own work, that there's still a correlation that needs to be made um, to how that, in, in what the implication is to the culinary industry, right? Like, you know, Hannah Hogg talks, is talking to and talking through um, certainly lifting up um, chefs and professional people who did this work, but it's also a celebration of tradition, tradition that translates into how people cook in their homes and it's not necessarily beholden specifically to this industry. Um, you know, AJ Miller writes um, soul food, which is a celebration of soul food traditions. But again, sometimes we conflate personal family traditions with traditions, traditions that translate into restaurants, which, which are, in my opinion, um, some of the one of the few battlegrounds we have in disseminating and trans and doing the hard work of translation of our food ways um, to a mass audience, right? Like sometimes we, we have these, like this conversation gets very circular sometimes because we, we are talking about multiple things in one conversation. We not, I'm not, so personally, the lens I do my work through um, is mainly concerned with how professional chefs, professional food creators, whose job it is to translate culture for um, a public who maybe doesn't have reference, that work has to be informed work. It can't just be um, frivolous. It can't be um, that there's a weight to and responsibility to that work. And it certainly um, that weight becomes much more urgent when you're talking about food traditions that are wildly marginalized and unfortunately misunderstood. So I wanted to create a book. I'm writing a book that is um, Beholden to the fidelity of our culture, is asking chefs, is asking the public, is asking folks who are coming to this work and picking up the baton um, 
this professional baton that is bequeathed to us for 250 years, right? Like if we, you are, you you want to pick up the baton, um, here's the, the foundation, here's, here's why it should matter. Here's why you should care about the, the very intentional shift of this work from domestic to profession. Here's why you need to understand that James Hemmings wasn't just a cool story, a footnote to Hamilton's, um, the Hamilton musical, but his, his coming back to this country enslaved was an act of patriotism. Like that, that those stories have to resonate when you decide to put on the tote and put on the whites. It's not just, you know, coming to be part of this. It sh surely is about being part of a, a, a kinetic and fun and artistic and joyful industry. To be a chef in this moment is about just artistry, but also about finding your own path. It's all of those things too. But with it, especially for Black chefs, it's got to mean more and it's got to be informed. I think that that's a, a brilliant concept that you have. I'm definitely excited to read it.